King Saul is dead. David is miles away in south Israel at another battle. And when he hears the, good, the news, which many think will be good news to him about Saul and his son Jonathan, who is Saul's son and David's dear friend, they've been killed in battle fighting the Philistines on Mount Gilboa. Saul's resentment of David has caused David to be on the run for years. And with the death of Saul, the way is now clear for David to become king. He had been anointed king years before. Now the time has come. With his destiny now open to him, you think it'd be a time to rejoice. But David does not rejoice. Instead, from somewhere deep within him comes this national lament, this, this poem of love and pain. He loves his people so. He loves Israel. He feels their national anguish, and he fully embraces their pain. Whatever David felt personally, his lament is for the nation's loss of their leader. Though David does not respect Saul as a man, he respects his position as king, and he mourns for Israel their loss of their king on the battlefield with the Philistines. 2 Samuel chapter 1 is David's it's a scream of pain. He will not be quiet, he will not be comforted, and he will not be ignored. It's a very candid outburst that can help us as a people and as a nation in times of national grief, in times of national mourning, in times of darkness. David gathers up all that he's feeling, his pain, his shock, his grief, and he gets a lament that is just raw, gut-wrenching beauty. Your glory, O Israel, lies slain on the mountain. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Or the daughters of the Philistines will rejoice at our loss. When David killed Goliath, the Philistine giant from Gath, the people of Gath mourned while Israel rejoiced. Now the tables are turned. The people of Gath must not hear about this, Israel's loss, lest they taunt us in our grief and make our grief even more unbearable. Don't let the Philistines know, David says. Don't let them catch you crying. Don't tell it in Gath because the people there will say, your God is weak. Your God didn't protect you. Your God can't help you. They'll think they've won. Oh, and they'll just lord it all over us. Don't let your enemies get away with that. Don't let them see you crying. Don't give them the satisfaction. Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not to the streets of Ashkelon. Instead, weep here at home among our own people and our own places. Let us grieve, but don't let us, our attackers, don't let our attackers celebrate. Let us emerge stronger for this, more united, bitter, not bitter, but better. And so he decreed that this lamentation, this poem, this song that he wrote, the people should be taught it so that they may grieve properly, honestly, give them voice to their pain. Because when pain or loss, grief overwhelm us, we often go silent. No words can really express our emotion. We need song, we need symbols, we need rituals to, to articulate our hurt that we can't put into words. Think of some of the symbols that resonate with us. The Vietnam Wall speaks pain that words cannot. The guards at the tomb of the unknown soldier at Arlington in their military precision and honor and respect. Walk in a silent vigil. The Iwo Jima Memorial. Protest songs of the 60s and peace signs now replicated in protest in our day. Flags flying at half mast and sidewalks covered with flowers and candles and stuffed animals and placards at schools and synagogues after mass shootings, protest marches and sit-ins, people chanting, giving a voice to injustice and suffering that they can't seem to make end. 
David gives voice to his people who hesitate to howl at God. Why can you do, how could you let this happen? David shows that the way to the future does not mean going away and abandoning and avoiding Mount Gilboa, but going up Mount Gilboa to the top, which he does. He hikes up the, hikes up the mountain and summons us there to face all this and even lambast and let out his anger at the place. You mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew, no rain on you, no bounteous fields. Let no grass grow and hide what happened here. Let no rain wash away the stains in the earth. For there the shield of the mighty was defiled. The shield of Saul, anointed with oil no more, not prepared. It's dried out, it's cracked, it's abandoned. His shield, which was our defense and our security, no longer is it ready for battle. Now it lies on Gilboa up there somewhere, abandoned. We face the future without the shield we trusted so long. Look at the bodies of those slain there, he says. See the bodies of Saul and Jonathan, the ones we loved. Turn aside, stop, look. Do not hide your face. Remember the strength of our nation. Grieve what we have lost as a people. Grieve our complacency. Grieve our complicity. Speak your pain and loss. And speak honestly with God what's in your heart. God is big enough to handle it. You're not going to scare him away by being honest and saying, you cannot heal from it if you don't deal with it. So in times of tragedy, we look for those who show us how to respond well. You remember after 9-11 and so many other times when Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers, came on the TV and he told the children, look for those who come to help. When you're frightened and don't know what to do, look for the helpers who are coming. We assure it after storms, after hurricanes, after natural disasters, all the people who are rushing in to help. People remember the photo of Jackie Kennedy, veiled in black, standing beside her son, John John, as he salutes the flag draped father of his, the coffin of his father, John F. Kennedy, assassinated. In recent years, presidents have gone to sites of natural disaster and human disasters, and shootings, and terrorist places. Sat with parents after school shootings. Leaders who have shown us how to respond well and give us permission to feel whatever we feel, even as they point us towards sources of hope. And so with all this clamor to display the Ten Commandments in schoolrooms, I say display the Beatitudes with them, if not instead of them. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in spirit, the humble. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled who pursue what is right and just and fair, they shall be filled. Instill those cardinal virtues in our schools, in our courts, and let our conduct reflect how God treats us and how we can treat one another better. And we may, may we nurture hope in God who is able to sustain David and the Israelites and us in times of national calamity or public pain and uncertainty. Walter Brueggemann, many of you know his writings, very challenging Bible scholar, argues that public grief is a scarce practice in our society, where we're so engaged in self-deception, we're pretending everything's all right, everything's okay. Underneath, under that propaganda, he says, however, we're a double, deeply troubled nation with a great deal of unprocessed public hurt, and we have no way to process this hurt. But this poem, David's Lament, is a model. 
And what he means and what David tells us is sometimes we just have to sit in our pain for a while until it's time to move on. We must reflect on our disappointments, reflect on our frustrations, even reflect on how we relate to our enemies. Reflect on those we won over to our way of thinking and behaving and those we have lost in our warring ways with one another. David models that lament over Saul and Jonathan. It's public sentiment and publics, pointing them to God and to one another for strength. But it seems that public sentiment in our media today and in our politics today and in our culture wars today suggests that if someone is your opponent, You can treat them any way you want to. Say anything about them, it doesn't matter. David instructs us otherwise. David refused to do Saul harm when he was alive, and he refuses to do so now and say ill of him now that he's dead. He is respectful of Saul even in a time of death. He may not have liked the man, but he respected the office and God's movement. Even our anger at God in this poem, in this lament, and in our own prayers is still directed at the very God from whom we expect to receive answers, from whom we need help. Speaking our pain, we can gain the hope that our bitter present can be transformed by God's better future. And wailing in our lament, we hope for healing It's not just unleashing anger and character assassination. It's lamenting what we have and wanting better. So give me a plan. Give me something to do. Tell me how we're going to fix it. And there are a few places we can speak of such painful things. People hush us with platitudes and dismiss our pain with a glib joke or a dark humor, and, and we're so divided and resentful we cannot share our political views without being ridiculed or vilified. And our pain in life and, and, and adversity and things troubles people so much that it isolates us from them. They insulate themselves. I don't want to go there. I don't want to hear that. Just as we try to isolate and silence their voices. But David knows that near to the heart of God is a place, a place of quiet rest, a place where sin cannot molest, a place of full release where all is joy and peace near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, hold us who wait before thee near to the heart of God. There is a place of quiet rest, in case you're trying to remember where that's from. And Psalm 139 reminds us there's no place we can go that God is not already there ahead of us. If I descend to heaven, you're there. If I descend into Sheol, you are there. If I sail to the ends of the world and in the ocean, you're there. Even there, your strong hand will hold me fast and protect me. Even darkness is not dark to you because to you, God, darkness and light, it's it's all the same. The night is as bright as the day. Even in our grief, God brings light out of darkness and brings hope out of the pain. Barbara Brown Taylor, in her book, Learning to Walk in the Darkness, new life starts in the dark, she says, whether it's a seed in the ground a baby in the womb, or Jesus in the tomb. It starts in the dark. When we're sad, grieving, worried, anxious, uncertain, the laughter of strangers and cheerful people feels like an affront to us. Do they not sense our pain or share our lament? Maybe we're not ready to move from this darkness yet. And she concludes, I have learned things in the dark that I could never have learned in the light. Things that have saved my life over and over so that there's really really only one logical conclusion. I need darkness as much as I need light. 
no matter your pain, no matter your confusion, no matter your grief, your uncertainty, what's troubling you, what's worrying you, what disappoints you, what, what causes you angst, God knows what's in your heart. He accepts you where you are, and he's ready to help you. You don't have to fake it. You don't have to go it alone. You can be brutally honest with God, not fearing that you will be estranged from God because he's going to resent what you say. No matter what you may be thinking, feeling, fearing, tell it to God. For God hears and God cares and God can change things. Picture David standing on top of Mount Gilboa, shaking his fist and shrieking pain and loss to God. We usually think of David as the little sweet singer of Israel and playing his harp and singing, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But in this story of anguish and outburst, David knows us. He helps us. Our enemies will hear us weep and pray and sing our lament in the assembly with God because this is how people of faith talk when we know that God has promised to be our God in all circumstances. We know Jesus, the Son of God, cried out in his own lament, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Philistines in Gath and Ashkelon, they're going to misunderstand. They're going to assume that David's lament, our lament, means our nation's spirit is broken and our faith is crushed. They'll mock us. They'll taunt us. Where's your God? Where's your God? I say our God is right here where we are gathered to be with God and with one another. This is where God is, here among the broken and the anxious, the confused, the worried, the sick, the aged, among the suffering America, and among every place in the world while people still cry out in pain. This is where God is. Mihi Kim Court, in her reflection on commentary on King Saul's death and David's lament for Israel, writes, this is the life God has for us. This is what matters. Not victory, not conquest, not triumphalism. This is what matters, that God holds us in our grief and saves us right here. In the face of the horrific injustice and inequities, the seeming constant stream of devastation in humanity, not only in faraway places, but right here in our own backyard, she writes, the darkness of our sufferings and needs to lament remain present. It may be hard to see, but God is at work redeeming human suffering and saving us from the grief by being right here in the darkness. You may, may ask God why what's happening in your life or in our nation or in our world is happening. Or even if God knows or cares about you and your circumstances. But I'll repeat what I preached last Sunday. God sees more than we see. And God has a plan. And repeatedly in the Bible comes God's assurance over and over. Fear not. I am with you to deliver you. Thanks be to God. Amen? Amen. God, it's all that easy to say, but all that hard to do. Help us to trust and to believe and to lament and then to look for the goodness to come in the land of the living. We trust in you, O oh God, and thank you for your grace upon us individually and as a people and as a world. Amen.